Hello, hello, hello. How is everybody? Thomas, good to see your shining face again. Yeah, I'm good now. Okay. <laughs> Where are you at, man? <laughs> Playing hide and seek. <clears throat> <laughs> We are at uh, Twist episode number 36. Can you all believe that? Where does time go, huh? All right. Well, we're having fun. So it goes wherever time goes when you're having fun. <clears throat> we just finished up a brilliant symposium that we'll have out for you guys uh, later tonight. Uh, we had on a uh, special guest, Robert Dean. So I just want to say hi to him one more time and Thank him again so much for coming on the show this morning. Uh, we're putting together um, a short series of stuff on American folklore with uh, with Dr. Crow. So keep an eye out there. Uh, watch the group as well, because we're going to be putting some more stuff in there on the American side of spirituality and folklore, uh, which is just fascinating for all of us. I know a lot of you are over there in Europe, too, so it should be um, some fairly somewhat new information. But yeah, Doc definitely has his own way of doing things and we appreciate him very much. So just one more time, wanted to thank him for, for doing the show earlier today. And I want to thank people for tuning into the special reports and yep. uh, the, the Rosslyn one has hit the ground running. So obviously you're enjoying that and stay tuned for many more. Many, many. And again, thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Uh, that money is definitely helping out with gear and software for everything right now. We've got, like Thomas was saying, uh, and Timony was saying, we've got a couple new series here in the works. And uh, again, we appreciate every little contribution made by all of you on Patreon. And thank you to all of you tuning in live on Facebook today. Uh, yeah, and for sharing this around to your friends and family. Uh, hi to uh, to Doc. I know you're watching there. I see you in the comments. And uh, if Rhett, if you're watching, thank you for tuning in. It's been awesome having you uh, talking to you about our show lately. Uh, quickly, Thomas, how are things over there in Ireland? Oh, the weather's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous weather. It's perfect spring. The flowers are coming up and uh, it's dry. Yeah, it's gorgeous, actually. And beautiful moonlit nights. Fantastic. We're kind of getting a little bit of the, the Irish weather here. We've got the spring has sprung and it's been uh, wet and rainy and just it has been beautiful. The, the air finally feels clear. Good. All right. So here we go. <clears throat> the story behind the world's most terrifying haunted doll. Here's something that most people would agree is true about Robert the doll. He's terrifying. Ostensibly a little boy in a sailor suit. His careworn face is only vaguely human. His nub of a nose looks like a pair of pinholes. He is covered in brown nicks like scars. His eyes are beady and black. He wears a malevolent smirk. Clasped in his lap, he's holding his own toy, a dog with garish popping eyes and a too big tongue lolling crazily out of his mouth. Here are some other things that people also agree is true about Robert, that he is haunted and that he has caused car accidents, broken bones, job loss, divorce, and a cornucopia of other misfortunes. Robert is now 117 years old and lives at the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida, in a new display case, which was recently donated by someone who is a fan of Robert's, says Corey Converito, curator of the museum. But the comfortable new digs, complete with humidity control and UV filtering glass to preserve the artifact, do not seem to have reformed Robert. The museum still gets regular reports of evils attributed to the doll. Before Robert came to the museum in 1994, he was the property of Robert Eugene Otto, an eccentric, eccentric artist and member of a prominent Key West family. Yes, the doll and the owner had the same name, but the boy answered to Jean. Robert was a childhood birthday gift from Otto's grandfather, who bought the doll during a trip to Germany. Otto's relationship with the doll continued into adulthood. What people really remember is what they would probably term as an unhealthy relationship with the doll. He brought it everywhere. He talked about it in the first person as if he weren't a doll. He was Robert. And as in, he is a living entity. After some digging, the museum traced Robert's origins to the Steve Company, the same toy maker that first manufactured a teddy bear in honor of Theodore Roosevelt. Robert was, the, was most likely never intended to be sold as a toy. A Steve historian told the museum that Robert was probably part of a set fabricated for a window display of clowns or jesters which is kind of adorable, especially with his impish behavior. It kind of suits his personality really well. Robert's little sailor suit was not supplied by the company. It was probably an outfit that Otto himself wore as a child. According to legend, young Otto began to blame mishaps on the doll. 
While this could have been laughed off as childish storytelling, adults also started noticing odd occurrences, especially as Otto and Robert grew older. As an adult, Otto lived in a stately home he called the Art House, the Artist House, where Robert could be seen positioned at the upstairs window. School children swore that he would appear and reappear, and they avoided the house. Myrtle Reuter purchased the Artist House after Otto's death in 1974 and also became Robert's new caretaker. Visitors swore they heard footsteps in the attic and giggling. Some claimed Robert's expression changed when anyone badmouthed Otto in his presence. Reuter said Robert would move around the house on his own, and after 20 years of antics, she donated him to the museum. But far from banishing Robert to obscurity, his arrival at the museum marked a turning point for the doll. Since Robert arrived, visitors have flocked to the museum to get a look at this mischievous toy. As he appeared on TV shows, he has had his aura photographed, he is a stop on a ghost tour, and he's inspired a horror movie. He has a Wikipedia entry and a social media account. Fans can buy Robert replicas, books, coasters, t-shirts, and the most adventurous can even volunteer to be locked in with Robert after dark. And they can and do write to him. He gets probably one to three letters every day, but they aren't typical fan letters. They're often apologies. Many visitors attribute post-visit misfortunes to failing to respect Robert or even openly disrespecting him. And they write begging forgiveness. Others ask him for advice or to hex those who have wronged him or wronged them. Um, Convertito says they have received more than a thousand letters, which they keep and catalog. Robert also receives emails and homages. At some point, it became known that Robert had a sweet tooth. So people leave and send him candy. Once he received a box containing eight bags of peppermints, a card and no return address. Exercising caution, the museum staff does not consume treats sent to Robert. Guests leave him sweets, money, and occasionally joints. <laughs> it's completely inappropriate. We are still a museum. Convertito is Robert's caretaker. Once a year, she administers a checkup, taking him out of the case and weighing him to assess whether the human Florida weather has adversely affected his straw-filled body. She is also his proxy, receiving and reading all his emails and letters and running his social media feeds. Several years ago, she photoshopped Robert's knobby face onto the now famous picture of Kim Kardashian popping a bottle of champagne into a glass balanced on her behind. <laughs> it was in order to attract attention to a campaign that would score the museum a grant if they garnered enough votes. Through the, combination, or through the combined forces of Kardashians and Robert's celebrity and the doll's social media reach, he has almost 9,000 Facebook likes, the museum won by a landslide. Occasionally, Convertito corresponds on Robert's behalf. She tries to send something to every child who writes him. Jean always had that childlike temperament around him, and we feel like Robert would want to be kind to the children. And she has also responded to more poignant ones, such as an email from a girl who was being bullied at school. So does Convertito think Robert is haunted? I don't know. I really don't, she said. I've never had a bad experience with him. I've never felt uncomfortable. It has always been a very basic relationship, and I have a job to do, and I go and I do it. And whether there's something to it or not, he just allows me to get on with my job. Sorry. <laughs> I, was looking, I was looking for, because that story always put the wheelies up me, okay? Especially the thing of the, outside the house and looking and people looking out outside the house and the, and the doll, Robert looking out the window at them. And I was just looking then. I thought I had it a little bit wrong. My apology. Do you ever hear about these ventriloquists who have dolls that walk off the stage into the audience and stuff like that? And it's the yeah. freakiest, creepiest thing you've ever seen. And they know they won't they won't tell you how it's done. They tell you it's things like, uh, you know, it's it's a robot or something like that. But the thing moves and talks to the audience members like it's a little a little man. And I often wonder if that's what inherit what possessed Robert is being used by some of these ventriloquists to actually animate dolls. Because that's been, that's, that was a, a great worry for centuries of building autom automatons. It's because they were terrified of them coming to life. Pope Sylvester had a talking head in 1000 AD that used to actually talk with a woman's voice. And he could ask his questions and things like that. And so I often wonder, is the is well, there must be a way to get spirits into, into dolls and bring them to life. But that Robert one, I, I mean, people talk about him being impish and cute. He scares the shit out of me. He looks like his skin has been peeled off or something. And you often wonder, was, you know, did, 
did the doll makers kill a child and put its soul into Robert or something like that? You often wonder about these kinds of creepy stories. But that thing is that thing is so legendary now. It's uh, it's quite remarkable that, that it's I, I, there's still people don't know about. It. I haven't talked about. Do you ever about Robert the Doll? And they go, no, I never heard about it. So it's and I think some of the Conjuring movies even covered him. And uh, yeah, so he's a he, he's a national treasure. But what is is the thing is what's in there? Is it is is it a, is what's in there? Is it a demon or something? Right. It's like that same thing. You mentioned the automatons already, Thomas. I was going to bring that up to that idea that back was that in like the, the 19th century, there were kind of clockwork automatons that uh, were just terribly complex. And I want to say that these entity attachments can occur to objects and devices that have a, uh, an incredible amount of complexity in them. And especially if there's a proxy there, like this, this woman who's the, uh, the caretaker of the doll somehow being a conduit and keeping the charisma, the charismatic charge of the doll going where if, if he were to be forgotten about, there wouldn't be as much of a, um, a reason for the entity within that doll to stick around. But the fact that they're just so there, you know, there's the social media thing. People are writing to it all the time. Uh, people are bringing it offerings that peppermint candies and everything. And I would imagine since there is so much attention being put onto Robert, the doll, that that's why that entity is stuck around in it. And if there wasn't as much of a, um, if it was just sitting in a, uh, a glass case somewhere and there wasn't a conduit, there wasn't a caretaker, and there wasn't a mythology around it. I imagine that entity would have moved on to something else where it could have, it, it could be getting something to feed off of. So it's like that same kind of thing we talk about with a lot electronics sometimes and with um, objects of, of perceived value where there's a certain amount of value attributed to a, to a particular object that that thing, that that entity can have an attachment to that thing, whether it's a, a smartphone, <laughs> a computer, a group of servers, uh, you know, a server farm or something, I would imagine that the, those entities can hop into that realm the same way they can hop into a doll that has that much of a, um, a charismatic charge. There was, a, there was a law in Bourbon, France, that you couldn't make automatons that were, that were human size. They were, you always had to distinguish that they were small, that they were not the same size as human. So even they were spooked by some of them things. And it also, you know, it also reminds me of necromancy, the kind of getting a putting a spirit into a body to animate a dead body. I read something very disturbing recently. Just and it was I was reading an interview with Paul Stanley from Kiss, and they were asking about things that he regretted in the music industry. And so he said one of the things was that he he felt like he had neglected Eric Carr, who was their drummer, who died of heart cancer. He thought he was going to get better. And they told him, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll, we'll just go get yourself better. But he had this rare form of cancer and he died. And uh, both him and Gene Simmons went to, it was a traditional Catholic funeral somewhere in New York. And they were both upset about it. And they, were, they, were, they looked upon his body and they were shocked. In the, it was an open coffin, an open casket. And they were shocked. And because uh, he, he was a good looking young guy and he'd been destroyed by the cancer that had eaten through him. So he had no hair or anything. And they were taken back, very disturbed by it. But his girlfriend went over. He had a pair of drumsticks in his hand, being the drummer in Kiss. And the girlfriend wanted the, the drumsticks to keep for herself. And when she took the drumsticks out of his hand, Eric Carr's dead body in the coffin went and pulled them back in front of everybody. And you wonder, you know, you do, you know, and here's that I would not, I don't know how I'd ever get over something like that. But uh, he said he saw it, his hand reached out and grabbed this drumstick and pulled it back. He said it was it was like something from a horror film. Right. Yeah. And it, <laughs> it's like, at me too. Is, is that the entity that um, runs the body or is that something else that came in afterwards, you know? Like that's, on the that's, yeah. yeah. That, that's, that's why I'm always cautious when people uh, put entities into things because it's like, you know, you're, you, if you're reanimating a corpse, you're not necessarily putting a, a human being back into that corpse. You're putting something else back in there. And, yeah. you know, it, it might have the, the considerations of that person because the, uh, the mind, memories, personality are all, um, are, are all dependent upon the body. You know, the, the memories and everything are, are, are built into the system, so to speak. And so uh, a walk-in or a, um, an entity that's attached to a body through necromancy can, you know, have access to memories and can have access to the thought the most basic, you know, thought patterns of that person. So yeah, that's, that's why I, uh, let's see what is, um, but yeah, uh, that, that, that's, 
that's all real fast, Danny. Yeah, Robert's got something interesting to uh, to com- comment on this. He said that golems, dummy dolls, hoodoo spirit dolls, Dybbuk, it's a tulpa created by the total belief of a child or disembodied spirit that was able to attach itself to the physical object and then feed off of the energy that was given to it uh, through those who come in contact with it, believe in it, so to speak, or who believe in it, so to speak. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> that, you know, the, the, the kid who used to have this doll uh, would attribute some of the things, um, some of the bad things in his life to this doll. So that, that, that could have brought the attachment to that entity at that point. Excellent points. Where the imaginary friend finds a home. Yikes. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah. I I, want to say the movie that this is based off of is called Brom. It's a really, really creepy movie. You guys should check it out. I'm pretty sure it's on. How do you spell that? Uh, Brom, B-R-A-U-M, like the first name. B-R-A-U-N. Like the shape, Ron. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's creepy as shit. I believe there's two of them. The first one's better, though. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> uh, this is a breaking story from a couple days ago. An underground city full of giant skeletons discovered in the Grand Canyon. In the early 20th century, chance led us to the gate of the underground town of the most prominent giants that, of that period. This was an unexpected unprecedented find in the Grand Canyon, which soon repeated in the press. The Grand Canyon was the birthplace of a culture in which, according to an article published in the Gazette de Arizona on April 5th, 1909, people of Cyclopean proportions existed, a civilization that only left us some structures as a testimony of its existence. The article mentions the discovery of a huge subterranean citadel by an explorer named G.E. Kincaid, who accidentally found it while rafting on the Colorado River. It is worth mentioning that Kincaid was a recognized archaeologist and had the financial support of the Smithsonian Institution. According to their descriptions, the entrance to this mysterious city was at the end of a tunnel that extended for something more than 1,600 meters underground. Kincaid was impressed that the cavern was almost inaccessible. The entrance was about 450 meters under the wall of the steep canyon. The place was in a zone protected by the government and the access was penalized under fire. Above a shelf that could not be seen from the river was the entrance to the cave. When I saw the chisel marks on the wall inside the entrance, I got interested. I got my gun and I went in. The architecture found suggested that the builders of that subterranean city possessed advanced engineering skills. The central axis of the underground city made it a gigantic camera from which radiated passages similar to the radii of the wheel. The walls of the main chamber were adorned with copper weapons and tablets, covered with symbols and hieroglyphic characters very similar to those we know in Egypt. Another interesting find was the discovery of mummified bones inside the citadel. None of the mummies found were less than 2.74 meters and were all wrapped in dark linen. Kincaid said he had taken photographs of one of them with a flashlight. However, none of those photos were ever found. Further explorations revealed interesting data on the beliefs of these alleged giants in the city. More than 30 meters from the entrance is a room with a cross-shaped plant several tens of meters long and where an idol was found that could have been the main god of this religious system. He was sitting cross-legged and with a lotus or lily flower in each hand. His face had oriental features as well as the carving of the cave. This idol had a certain resemblance to Buddha, although the scientists of the time did not finish assuring that it represented that religious cult. The article also talks about the discovery of ceramics and other artifacts with trademarks having been manufactured in other parts of the world. Perhaps a rare mixture of cultures that scarcely occurs in archaeological finds, so this discovery would be of unprecedented importance. The last camera they found on the exploration was what Kincaid and his partner, Professor Professor S.A. Jordan, a ceremonial crypt believed to be at the end of the Great Hall where they found the mummies. Unfortunately, the article does not give many more details about this discovery, nor are there any official versions or references to this enigmatic subterranean city. The Smithsonian Institute denies having knowledge of the existence of this underground city. This, uh, I'm going to throw another flavor into the mix of these stories as they're usually told, right? They're all over the world. They're always underground and they're always 
populated by giants, right? Now, I was, I've been in the house of um, in Malta, and there's no way that that thing was built by primitive people. It's far too elegant and ornate and everything. But at the end of it, there's a park where it looks like a dock into the inner air. I swear that's what it looks like. You're waiting to get on a boat. And then it goes into the natural cave systems under Malta. And there's the stories of the giants under there. Now, there's the stories of this guy in the Grand Canyon and the stories all over Ireland and other countries of going into the earth, you encountered it. And the Harry Houdini's favorite famous story with Love, that he told Lovecraft and the, underneath the Sphinx. What I would like to suggest is that the reason why they don't refine these places is because they're actually in another reality. And when you enter into the earth, you're not only entering into a subterranean world, but you're entering into a different reality. And you may see all these things under the ground, come out, tell people about them, and say, come on back, and I'll show you, and they're gone. Because only you experienced them while you were in that version of space-time. Because they exist outside the space-time that we're presently experienced. And I think that could explain why these places are all over the world. They all have the same story, but they can, no one can ever refine them. After, and no one can ever refine the experience. There's a the famous and frightening story of the school on their Malta that we're exploring. And a giant beckoned them into the cave like to come. And they were never heard of ever again. A whole school party were never heard of ever again. And that was reported in the National Geographic magazine as a news story, not as a folklore story. It happened in the 30s. And there's an American correspondent was actually there in Malta during the war. And he reported this as an actual fact, not as an actual legend. So that could be a way of explaining what's actually happened. And that brings us back around to the Vrilia uh, and story again. It is these other entities that live inside the earth and their world is not normally accessible to us. It's just outside our perception. And I think that's why when they go back to look for these places, they never find them again. I'd like to add to that, that perhaps what could cause that um, shift to occur is there might be some little bit of remaining artifact uh, of that civilization that's there that somehow um, triggers something in the cognition of the person who goes exploring in there where they come across something that's just like a leftover little little bit of a statue or a leftover little bit of a building that that whole remaining building, the whole remaining statue, uh, their, their mind and their, their consciousness mock that thing up. Not not in a uh, not in a way of, of of fantasy, but like you're saying, going into this other reality that once existed. So like that, they they might see the way that that structure used to exist a hundred million years ago, or whatever it happens to be when when that civilization was there two thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, whatever it is that um, they might slip into another reality where that that um, flavor of time is still carrying on. Just like you know, you, with with the way the same way that remote viewers can tap into something like that, that um, that gestalt, whatever you want to call it, that facsimile of that um, time is still there. And these people that do this uh, tend to be the kind of people that can be open to that. You know, they don't have the psychic censorship um, kicked up as high as most people do because you know, like we're talking about on the last show, people will have these experiences and just totally. Um, totally uh, uh, compartmentalize them away as, oh, that's not possible. So that the psychic sensor within their, their cognition shuts these things out, but it's the people who are more willing to have these kind of experiences and be more acceptable to them who can go down there and slip into these different realities, I would imagine, if that's the case. Well, you, when you think about like the, 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 the megalithic mounds, the ones that have passages in them, like West Kennick, Long Barrow, they almost feel like their entrance is into somewhere else. And maybe the ancient ancestors could actually access this world by actually building these. Like, I'll give you an example. Here in Ireland, there's a place called Nout. And it was only this, it was a hail that they knew there was something in it. But they only broke into it in 1957. And the actual description of finding it, the archaeologist, is just one of these fantastic stories. He popped his head through a hole in the ground, realized he was in an open space, turned on his electric flashlight, and this whole Neolithic gallery of artwork that was never seen in 5,000 years was there. And, you know, it was just laid out before him. Now, why did they seal it up? Well, maybe they didn't seal it up. Could, that, could they be actually portals between their world? And they do call them portal dolmens between 
their world and our world. And rather than stumbling upon these things in a cave accidentally, like modern people do, could the ancient ancestors actually build like airports and these these some of these mountains are like airports to actually go between worlds? Yeah, I mean that's like that same kind of concept about like a stargate or something to be able to yeah. actually transfer to, you know, we, we've talked about trying to leave the planet through jet propulsion, um, and there being a difficulty with escaping the. Um, the the connection that people have with their body to the planet but if someone were to tran- to uh to transcend this reality construct and go into another reality construct th- through these portals that would be the most effective way to do it and um yeah there's been tv shows and all kinds of stuff written about this concept but and and i would imagine again like you're saying people go back to try to find these again and they're just not there well so. the thing is also is when when these things are found like white on rice instantaneously the jesuits the National Geographic, the Royal Societies, the Smithsonian, they jump on it like a ton of bricks to instantly shut down any narrative that's outside what could possibly be, you know, their prevailing mainstream narrative. There's endless stories of in Sardinia, farmers bringing gigantic human bones like teeth and fingers to, to the university there, femurs or huge skeletons, and they think it's going to be on the news in a few days and it just disappears and is never seen again. There seems to be a network within academia that's devoted to shutting this stuff down. Like we're not supposed, they don't want us to know it. Yeah, or like the the rumors of uh, uh, Egyptian stele being found at the at the at the mouth of the Mississippi River uh, a century or so ago, and all uh, you know, all the, the what we would consider now to be Egyptian artifacts throughout the United States just being gathered up and, and put into different um, into different museums, and said that these were brought over from Egypt when they might actually have been here. In, in on this continent first yeah. but again you know the smithsonian or whatever it is gobbling those things up and, and uh, putting some sort of um, um narrative over the top of it to keep things in the quote-unquote like biblical time frame so to speak like they've got a time scale that they have to stick to and keeping that time scale um you know if anything goes outside of that they can't have the public they, they can't have the public um being aware of that type of thing and you look at go back to Tepe. That was the liberty buried buried them. After they finished this monument in Turkey, they think they buried it what well, thirteen, fourteen thousand years ago. Now that made you think yourself, why would you go to all the trouble to build this thing and then completely bury it? Well, think about it. If you were if if it was to be accessed in a non-material manner, it's like a vote of a vote of offering to these other entities inside the earth in their own domain. That's almost like a vote of confidence here. Look, we believe in you. Can we come and visit you? You know, something like, like, a, like that kind of thing. It's rather, you know, like we, we don't mind burying it because we know that we, will, we can get back down to it somehow. Yeah, too, and I was going to go in on that same thread of what you guys were just talking about. You know, I, I personally think the, the academics way, way, way high up, they, they know that whatever the mainstream um, thing about it is, is bullshit. And the rest of, you know, the the majority of all the archaeologists and all of them you know they're they're just bamboozled too they they have no idea but i think a a big part of why this stuff never actually comes out is because um it would go directly in the face of what the prescribed uh you know religious dogma is you know they'd have to rewrite all of that shit like over in egypt you know all of that stuff is owned by the british museum um and they just simply cannot ever say that yeah this shit is way older than however many a couple thousand years old because they would have to rewrite their entire uh um religious systems which they just simply cannot and will not ever do so we're never going to get it from there well that's what happened now that the archaeologist who opened it up i think his name is ethany and rin and he went and he was the first person to open it in five thousand years five and a half thousand years that's their timeline and there was not one single body that it was found inside it. Nothing. Nobody was found inside it. And then he wrote an thesis paper on it that it was a burial mound dedicated to the autumnal equinox. And yet not a single body was found in it. And he wrote that it was a burial mound. Yeah, they just they have a whole like flow chart of things to to classify something as in order to in order to just play it off to, to keep that dogma going, to keep the, the time scale, to keep the their um their paradigm afloat. I see it all the time in the academia here. It's 
Um, not so much now, but it used to be run out of Minute University, which is a very Jesuitic university. And I have a, a fantastic paper on the swastika in Ireland. The swastika appears all over Ireland. And the guy who wrote it, who it turns out was a religious fanatic who claimed it was a crucifix celebrating the glory of Jesus Christ. When it's clearly a swastika like you see in the Hindu world. And it's on thing. And it, all he, what all he was doing was he knew that those things were spectacularly ancient. And he was just trying to bring them up into the BC, into the BC AD period, just so they could not be so old. And therefore, he said they're early Christian monuments and the swastikas represent Jesus. And it's a, it's a pile of absolute, a crock of absolute shit that he comes out with. And yet he's considered like one of the premier archaeologists. Yeah, and it's just it's just so interesting that like maybe even 10, 20 years ago, there was so much. Now, that was a weird phenomenon that we heard through the speakers. I don't know. If, did you hear that on your end, Thomas? No. OK, we'll see if it's on the playback. But it's so interesting that like 10, 20, 30 years ago, there is such a, um, a trust and level of faith in academia and that paradigm. And it's just here within the last, I don't know. 10 years, that whole paradigm has just become so irrelevant where it's like they, they only exist within their own paradigm now where it's like back, you know, not that long ago, pe everybody bought into that. And now it's like there are, you know, you got people listening to Joe Rogan who, you know, a few years ago, people listening to Joe Rogan were considered uh, very, very uh, out there types. And, you know, it's like now that's kind of become the mainstream now. So people are, are swinging in, in that direction of being more open to these things where academia unless you're part of that paradigm doesn't mean shit, you know? And I, I like that we're heading in that direction that, yeah, you know, if you want to be part of that paradigm, that's cool, but we don't need to have those kind of credentials anymore in order to get information out there. Now that we've got, you know, Facebook live and YouTube and everything. Uh, if you have work that um, is legitimate and done earnestly and you're not pushing some kind of bullshit agenda, you'll find people out there who are interested in it. You know, yep. that's, that's the real beauty of what we're doing now. And you, you don't have to, um, you don't have to, to be an academic to have a point of view anymore for people to listen to. You know, here we are talking, none of us are academics, and we're able to share this information with all of you out there. Well, I know a, a, an archaeologist here is qualified to university, and you know what she does for a living? She now teaches piano. She couldn't deal anymore with the bullshit and the lies. They would find that anomalies all over the place. Like they'd find things at levels that they weren't supposed to be. And she said, no, this makes no sense. This is clearly not at the Christian level. It's much older. And the guy said, well, just, just put it up on the top there and say it was. It's the kind of things that were going on. That the, the head, if you go to any archaeology dig around here, and I'm sure it's the same in most countries, it's always the same. It's the weirdest thing. There's a male archaeologist who's like the boss. He sits around and greets the visitors or people who are like interested. And they oh, what are you doing? Oh, we're having a dig on this Neolithic mound. And it's always two or three girls in university students in the, in the mud, digging it with the most miserable looks on their faces. It's the weirdest thing, but every dig I've ever stumbled upon in Ireland and in England as well, it's always the same. A male archaeologist who's like the kind of godfather and two or three women in the ditch actually doing the work. And he's making sure that they don't see something. But I was actually told that they'd seen archaeologists move things with their feet. I know it wasn't found there. It was found over here. So there's obviously some kind of group inside all archaeology that says you'll keep your job if you don't rock the boat. It has to be something like that. Yeah. And it's good that just all of that is going into obscurity now. Like it used to be like that paradigm used to be able to be upheld. And now it's just, it's crumbling and there's actually people out there going and doing research like, um, uh, uh, um, Gary, uh, Brad, Brad Olson being able to go down and actually do his own trip to Antarctica funded, you know, and, and privately going and doing research. And he, you know, he's not part of academia and it's, it's, it's great that people are doing that, that, you know, it, it's us going out there and doing research. You don't have to be an academic. You don't have to be an archeologist. You don't have to have all the degrees and the pedigree in order to bring information forward. And he, even, I want to say back as far as like maybe 2012, 10 years ago, you had to have a certain amount of pedigree for people to listen to you to an extent but now it's just like, okay, you know, if someone brings this information forward and they're not pushing some bullshit agenda, you know, there's, there's platforms like this for people yeah. to share information about. And, you know, like we talk about with Joe Rogan, he's bringing on guests that are, that are, you know, rocking the boat, you know, going against the, uh, going against the grain that's been prescribed by, you know, the people who want to keep the biblical um, uh, timescale of things. 
and it's just that that's all that's that's all crumbling around us. The veils being uh, being removed. I met a guy recently in England who does uh, an archaeology podcast. It's mainstream. He has regular real archaeologists on it. And I was I was just talking to him about like alternative theories, and he said the same to me. None of them are wrong because the mainstream guys don't know any more than what we do. They're in the world of guesstimates as well. Yep. It's it's like a WWF fight. <laughs> We're in the world of fucking around and finding out <laughs> the real scientific method. Okay. <clears throat> Woman reports sighting of tall owl-like being with bright glowing red eyes near O'Hare International Airport. Warning, <laughs> this article contains strong language in adult situations. <laughs> Manuel Navarrete of UFO Clearinghouse recently received the following report from a woman who claimed that she and her friend encountered a creature with bright red eyes and a big black body while parked at a construction site near Chicago's O'Hare International Airport at around 10 p.m. on March 5th. I was out driving around with a guy I had just started talking to. We were out by the airport, just cruising around, listening to music and getting to know one another. We decided to park to smoke some bud and one thing led to another. We were in the back seat when he looked over and started screaming, what the fuck over and over again. It was then that we felt like something bumped into the side of the car, like when someone slammed up on the side of your ride. I sat up and saw a pair of bright red eyes and a big black body looking into the driver's side window into the back seat. It scared the hell out of both of us. And we both started screaming out loud. This thing kept looking into the car and then it just disappeared. A security guard shows up. Then two more show up. They made us get out of the car and started asking us why we were there. But after looking at us, they started asking about what we had seen. We told them and they screamed at us to get dressed and leave. Get dressed. <laughs> Never had said that after some convincing, he was able to speak with the witness over the phone. I contacted the witness via email, and after much assurance, she agreed to an interview over the phone. The, investi the investigator called and spoke with a woman whom he described as a 20-year-old Hispanic woman. Her companion that evening, he said, was a 26-year-old man and also Hispanic. According to what the witness told Navarrete, she and her friend had been out driving around when they decided to stop at a construction site near the airport to talk. No one was around at the site, given the late hour, and the couple... The couple decided to park near the entrance, but still out of the way to avoid law enforcement. For the witness's sake, I asked her to please skip the details and to please just stick to the sighting itself. She described the entity as being tall and thinly built with bright red eyes that were glowing. She also described the feeling the car move as if someone had slammed against the side of it, followed by her partner starting to scream. The witness described the entity as bending down to peer into the window and from the brief glimpse she saw of it when she sat up, described it as owl-like. Her partner told her that it looked like its eyes were set into the entity's shoulders. The witness stated that the creature was gone within a few seconds and that almost immediately the security guards arrived. When asked how long from the creature leaving to the security guards arriving, the witness said that she was certain the guards had to have seen the creature taking off as they arrived. When Navarrete asked the witness about the security guard, he said she told him that the guards asked them to get out of the car and seeing the state of them, asked them why they were there and what they had seen. The guards questioned them for a few minutes, took their information, and then told them to finish getting dressed and leave immediately. She said they were both told that the next time they were seen at this site, they would be arrested immediately. Following the encounter, the witnesses reportedly left and the young woman was dropped off at home. Navarrete said that he asked about the second witness's contact information, but the woman told him that the man did not want to be contacted and that they had only talked a few times after the event, but had not gone out again. The witness then expressed her desire to conclude the interview, and I thanked her for her time. He explained that the construction site where the sighting reportedly happened is on Highway 72 and that he planned to conduct a field in investigation of the area soon. Never speculated that the construction could be part of the expansion project currently happening at the airport, but said that the details will be confirmed with further investigation. Research by investigator Tobias Whalen into incomplete construction project, projects at O'Hare showed that a major, a major expansion for a Terminal 5 is currently underway, but is located on the southeastern edge of the airport's campus, directly opposite of the reported sited location. 
However, the I-490, I-90 interchange project is still underway adjacent to the siting area. And while not attached to the airport, would explain the construction site's location. This makes it unlikely that the witness encountered the coordinated security response mentioned in other encounters in and around the airport. Navarrete promised that any information obtained during the field investigation will be on the UFO Clearinghouse website and shared with Phantoms and Monsters 14 research team. As of right now, this is an ongoing investigation and further information will be posted as it becomes available. The Singular 14 Society partners with both UFO Clearinghouse and Phantoms and Monsters to investigate anomalous sightings and will update this article with any new information that it receives. O'Hare International Airport has been the epicenter of recent winged humanoid sightings in the Lake Michigan Mothman investigation, with over a dozen sightings sightings reports coming from the airport itself since August of 2019, and many more reported in the surrounding communities. Reports from the larger investigation have come from every state bordering Lake Michigan and date back to 1957. This report constitutes the latest news in a string of Mothman-like sightings from within a few hundred mile radius surrounding Lake Michigan, including every state bordering the Great Lake. These sightings ostensibly began in the spring of 2017, but more historical accounts are being reported as more people become aware of the phenomenon. They generally take place in the evening or at night, often in or near a park or natural area and around water. Witnesses consistently describe a large gray, brown, or black bat or bird-like creature, although in a small number of cases, the creature was described as insect-like, sometimes with glowing or reflective red, yellow, green, or orange eyes, and humanoid features such as arms and legs are often reported. Some witnesses have reported feeling intense fear and an aura of evil emanating from the creature that they encounter. Many of the sightings are also of something seen only briefly or are described only as a flying creature with few details which leaves open the possibility that a misidentified large bird, such as a heron or crane, or some type of anomalous avian species could explain some, although certainly not all, of the encounters. A number of associated high strangeness incidents have also occurred alongside the creature sightings. These include reports of UFOs, other anomalous flying creatures, and mysterious humanoids, parapsychological phenomena, and bizarre events experienced by those investigating the sightings. It's just interesting how these these things um, tend to show up around uh, parts of the earth that have been excavated, and especially when there are crossroads or something where there's a, there's a tremendous amount of traffic going through, like an airport. And I know we've talked about different types of underground entities before. And again, like in the last story, digging underground and possibly um, at a construction site, something coming out that used to... Uh, that was dwelling under that part of the ground so that, you know, like an old abandoned house or an old abandoned type of um, part of town where these, these entities live, it almost sounds like that might be what's going on here is that there is something living here that when they started doing this construction, it got disturbed and the thing came out and, and came into somewhat of a semi-physical form that people could interact with. I, I saw a map of Chicago from the early 1800s before the railroads were built. And that's really what made Chicago a, a powerhouse. house. That city grew up incredibly quickly because of all the railroads bringing all the commodities from the East and West Coast to there, to there and distributing from that point on. But on the map, there are numerous, what they call Indian mounds were marked out. There were barrows, like I was just talking about earlier on, all along the coast of the lake where the lake was where the city center will be built now. So you wonder if they've disturbed something like that. Well, you know, you wonder, you wonder if there were stories like this when Chicago was first built and stuff like that, when it started putting the skyscrapers up. But that's funny how that story is so similar to the original Mothman sightings. I'm wondering now if there's a sexual energy creates it, because the original Mothman sightings in 64, 66, whenever it was, there was a group of teenagers, you know, doing the wild thing out in the TNT area. I would say Point Pleasant. And I'm starting to wonder now, is the actual sex act what actually manifests these things? Like it's a kind of like a sex magic thing going down. That airport expansion is gigantic. I'm a, I am I watch a lot of like infrastructure videos online. And that one, that's, that's going to be like, O'Hare is going to be like the biggest airport in the world when it's finished. They're like, you know, chewing up huge amounts of area around it. 
So I'm wondering if they, if they disturb these mounds again. But I do find it interesting that in both cases, the, the sightings were about, you know, young people having sex. If there's a sexual thing to it, a sex energy, sex magic thing going on there by default. Yeah. And I'm wondering, too, we've talked about, you know, airports being liminal spaces. You know, it's a gateway to another world, you know, literally get on a plane and go almost anywhere in the world. And so expanding that more, you know, breaking ground, breaking new ground, opening up new things, you know, and, and that portal just growing bigger and bigger. If if that is also something that would attract a being like that. Another aspect, too, is and it's an interesting one. You know, the way it's supposed to be a city built underneath Denver Airport. Now you mm-hmm. do wonder if during this, con- this construction of this airport has taken a long time and the guards said to be immediately arrested if they come back. You do wonder if they're actually up to no good, no good nicks underneath the ground there as well. Like the same kind of forces. Yeah. And I wonder too, with the, this, this alleged city beneath the Denver international airport, if uh, that was there before the airport was, and they accidentally, you know, accidentally came across it. I would imagine sometimes like we've talked about previous civilizations on the continent and you're going through and doing a, a dig and suddenly you find perfectly intact tunnels that haven't been used for however long. And I, I wonder if that's what occurred there at the Denver International Airport is they they, they found something that had been there already. And, I believe you know, I believe the conspiracies yeah. around that airport as well because it's too fucked up not to be true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why did they deliberately have these weird gargoyles and stuff all over the terminal? That, what's that going to do with airports? And then that mural, now they showed, like, now they discovered now that the, kid, the kids who were dying were wearing masks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What, what, what kind of psychedelic experiences were, were the artists and architects working on that project having for them to mock up that kind of strange art around that place? And just uh, the, the weird uh, material that they use, uh, the thermal blocking material that if you, to be able to put, they put on top of those tents. So if you look down at the Denver International Airport for, with a thermal view, you can't see anything through it because they've got such good thermal blocking technology there on top of the terminal. And what's that about, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that, that so maybe something like that, that this is going on in our hair. And yeah. uh, it has just, it's funny, I, I, in the, in the Roslyn documentary, I mentioned that it was built next to one of the biggest ammunition factory in the world. And uh, it's the TNT area in Point Pleasant where the Mothman, that was one of the biggest ammunition factories in the world as well. There seems to be all these commonalities between all these stories. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, like you said, um, uh, you know, warriors fighting for the Jin Jehovah, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's there's definitely something creepy, though, about these. Um, yeah, we keep getting Are weird. F- that? Yeah, you guys hearing the weird voice phenomena? No, it keeps happening whenever we talk about these topics. But yeah, there's there's definitely something creepy, though, about some of these, these airports where... Um, you know, whether it's that uh, you can bring people coming and going through these airports from all, all over the planet, like if there are other if there are other bases on the planet that can be accessed uh, and, you know, the, there are certain types of people that go back and forth between these um, these airports. It's, you know, the best means of transportation. And uh, but, yeah, there's just something tremendously creepy about it. And I bet whatever it was that they ran into in this um this construction site was definitely something that was disturbed that uh, didn't, you know, we talked about this with doc in the last show that sometimes there are entities that are there in the room and they don't mean you any harm, but sometimes you might, you know, kick a wasp's nest for instance. And uh, you know, you you just don't want to do that. You don't, you don't want to be messing around with the space of of some sort of entity that lives underground, for instance. And and, and the elites do build these tunnels for their own use and everything like that. There is a, there's a tunnel in the new Dublin that you know it was built for to bring prostitutes to the King of England when he was visiting. They wouldn't be seen traveling over ground. To use the comp- so imagine they went all that trouble to build a tunnel for prostitutes for some royalty to be used like once every few years. So what, what would they build that they really need? You know, they, 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 these people live in a whole other world. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I'm ready to hear the psychic weather if you're ready to dish it out. All right. Is it bad? Is it great? Are you happy? Are you irate? The week in psychic weather. Hello, everybody. This week's psychic weather is get ready to have your heart broken. This is the time of the year when people just leave. They just walk away. 
They don't tell you why. They just change. They just go. And you never get any resolution or any closure. This is the time of year when people who are in relationships with pathological individuals wake up one morning where they send up flowers that one day and the next day they're just completely gone without a trace. This always happens once the weather starts to get better. And there's a, I always watch the regular weather for this. It's almost like the weather change when it starts to get better. If they're almost like they fluttered their pathological wings and just vanished. It won't. It's always now. They don't leave for any reason. You cannot put a finger on it. Why? Why it's happened? You cannot understand why it's happened. And it's not necessarily a romantic relationship. It could be a business partner. It could be a friendship. They will just back off. They will just vanish like that, and you will be left stunned. And you won't get closure, and you'll never know why. And the best thing is to just go no contact ever again and get on with your life. So that's it this week. Uh, I'm not trying to make people paranoid, but starting now and for the next few weeks, prepare to have your heart broken, followed by what the fuck was that? And this is this week in Psychic Weather by Thomas Sheridan. Is it bad? Is it great? Are you happy? Are you irate? The week in Psychic Weather. Wow. <laughs> I don't really know what else to say to that other than, you know, no, no motherfucker is worth a tailspin that bad. Yeah. So, yeah, just uh, pick up and carry on and put yourself back together and keep on going. Yeah. Yeah, because like, you're not the only one that's got it. Lots of people have gotten it. It's just they may not even be necessarily evil. It's just that these it's just that springtime seems to do it as they fly yeah. away unexpectedly. And you, you'll be left in the lurch. And like I said, don't, don't automatically assume it's a romantic thing. It could be very much a friendship or a business partner or someone happened to me with a fucker in a band once that we were on, like, <laughs> over to play their gigs. And uh, we've been rehearsing and everything and he fucked off, you know? So it can, like, right now, this time of year, like, this is 20 odd years ago. But yeah, it will happen. Yeah. And good fucking riddance, too. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Okay. U.S. covertly experiments mind control on people across continents for decades. No official apology. They've taken away enough from me. I don't remember my birth name. I am not in contact with my children. It is a very degrading, devastating reality, said 17, said 72-year-old Miriam Ruhula, an MK Ultra victim who now lives in Grand Prairie, Texas. MK Ultra is the code name of a human experiment program designed and undertaken by the U.S. and its notorious spy agency, the CIA. It started on April 13th, 1953 and lasted for 20 years. It was the height of the Cold War and the U.S. designed covert operation, among which was MK Ultra, aimed at developing tools that could be used against Soviet bloc enemies to control human behavior with drugs and other psychological manipulators. Psychedel psychedelic drugs paralytics and electroshock therapy, all heinous and inhumane techniques were clandestinely, but routinely used on humans. They included citizens from the U S and other countries who were unwitting test subjects an encapsulation of immense human rights violations. Many experiments were conducted at Fort Detrick as a base, as a key base of operations. Many people died as a result of these experiments. Those who did survive had their memories forcibly erased, forgetting their names and having their personalities irrevo irrevocably altered and faced threats to their lives, living in fear for the remainder of their days. More than 40 years on, the physical, mental, emotional, social horrors in and injuries are still with her. U.S. Mind Control Scheme The psychosis induction of Rahula started when she was five or six while attending a parade in London. She was then brought to the U.S. where CIA operatives were would continuously use a recording played over tape recorder to embed in her mind what they wanted her to become in her own memory. I remember one time I had been given electric shock treatments and was returned to a room. When I regained a little bit of consciousness, I heard one of the hospital staff say something to the effect of, why do they do this to her? Why are they giving her so many shock treatments? Rula believed that what was happening to her was political because of her Iranian heritage. She was then relocated, taken away, and lived and was educated in Russia afterwards. At 19, she married an American and moved back to the U.S. 
Seven years later, a member of U.S. law enforcement agency entered her house and told her she had to be put in protective custody. Although she greatly protested, she was forced to go. She was not able to contact her husband or her son, who was about six years old at the time. It was the second time that she would be an unwilling participant in a mind control program. Rahula said she had been living somebody else's lie. You remain physically drained because there's something that drains your spirit. You cannot hold a conversation with anyone regarding a situation because everyone that is allowed in your life goes along with the lie, either out of total indifference or complacency, or because they build an allegiance to the government that they have to continue this lie or something will happen to them. The CIA mind control schemes did not just remain on U.S. soil, but were extended to U.S. allied countries, including Denmark, Australia, and Canada. In December 2021, a Danish documentary titled The Search for Myself was released, leveling claims against the CIA that in the early 60s, it had financially aided experiments on 311 Danish children, a good number of whom were orphans or adopted. The filmmaker, Pierre Winnick himself was one of them. Winnick told Radio Denmark that as one of the kids forced to participate in the experiment, he had electrodes placed on his arms, legs, and chest around his heart. The children were also subjected to loud and high-pitched sounds, which was very uncomfortable. According to Australian media reports, the U.S. once took the experiments to Australia in the 60s that involved Sydney University psychology students. What took place in the Danish documentary and Australian media reports was just the tip of the iceberg. Between 1950 and 1964, experiments funded by the Canadian government and covertly in part by the CIA as part of MKUltra were conducted at the Allen Memorial Institute of McGill University in Canada and were led by Scottish uh, psychiatrist Dr. Ewan Cameron. None of the Canadian patients provided consent or knew that they were being used for clandestine research purposes. So far, neither the CIA nor the Canadian government has apologized for either role in the experiments which ruined hundreds of families. Julie Tanney's family is one of them. In 1957, when she was five years old, her father went to see a doctor as he had um, a form of neuralgia, while the doctor who worked in cahoots with Dr. Cameron put him into one of the many brainwashing programs. Tanny told the Global Times that her father was put to sleep first. Then he was forced to listen to clips of some of the things he had said on a continual 24-hour loop underneath his pillow while he slept as part of the brainwashing process. Then he would be subjected to shock treatments administered using a machine called the Page Russells, which emitted voltages about 75 times the strength of a regular shock treatment, and the aim was to wipe his memory. Such experiments were administered on Tanny's father for three months, and he was discharged because he still has ties to his former life. He returned home, but the happy family was soon destroyed. Colin A. Ross, a U.S.-based psychiatrist, wrote a book titled The CIA Doctors, Human Rights Violations, by uh, American psychiatrists after reading a collection of 15,000 page files from the CIA reading room. As a psychiatrist, he believes the CIA mind control prob- programs were very abusive to innate and innate to human nature. Moreover, Ross calls into question the medical ethics of said CIA doctors. You have to create psychiatric disorder on purpose, which is completely the opposite of the purpose of psychiatry. As the, and the patient, the subject doesn't give informed consent. They don't have legal representation, so it completely violates all medical ethics. Despite mounting backlash and condemnation, the CIA is yet to officially apologize for the actions it took during the Cold War and after. The CIA's mind control projects are still relevant today because they provide a horrific historical narrative of intelligence misconduct in a country that keeps touting human rights and freedom. The problem I have with the United States, while I am a U.S. citizen, is that they tend to point the finger accuse other countries around the world of human rights violations, but they don't take responsibility for their own actions. So I think it's hypocritical and it's all part of a geopolitical maneuvering and so on. This is the typical style of U.S. democracy, violating human rights and committing crimes at will and then being forced to acknowledge it decades later. Uh, Tani said she gets many emails from people who said they are currently being experimented on and she believes mind control experiments are still ongoing, albeit not quite as primitive as those performed in the 50s. I guess today there's different ways of mind control that are a lot more progressive than what they did in the past. It's hard to know, but I wouldn't at all be surprised. Governments are governments. I don't think all that much has changed. Our world has become all about power and control. The CIA MKUltra program was brought to the public's attention in 1975 
and victims and their families in Canada started to fight for the responsible parties to be brought to justice and be held accountable for the lifelong pain and suffering. In 1980 lawsuit, a 1980 lawsuit, which dragged on for eight years, made nine Canadians receive only $67,000 each from the U.S. Department of Justice. Tanny's father died in 1992, the same day his wife, Tanny's mother, received compensation worth $100,000 by the Canadian government. He was among the 77 victims who received such compensation. But for Tanny, this was just a drop in the bucket in comparison to the whopping $2 million it took her mother to care for her father. And her mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer very shortly after the death of her father. In 2017, she and other victims formed the group Survivor, Survivors Allies Against Government Abuse to exert more pressure on the defendants. And she keeps meeting new people who are victims of such mind control programs. Tanny has filed a request for a class action lawsuit against the U.S. and Canadian governments, the McGill University Health Center, the McGill University, and the Allen Memorial Institute, hoping this will extend compensation to family members and other victims. Tanny told the Global Times that they will be in court against the U.S. government on April 26th. Rahula said that she hopes the world will remember the immense suffering of MK Ultra victims by setting aside a special day. I know after apartheid, they had a reconciliation council. We don't have anything like that, be it MK Ultra, slavery, genocide of the Native Americans. In order for the individuals in the country to heal, there needs to be acknowledgement, there needs to be apologies, there needs to be compensation, and there needs to be a genuine reconciliation. Oh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's so interesting that, um, Throughout time, we'll look at uh, projects like MK Ultra and Mind Control and Brain. We'll very quickly dismiss it, but it's 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 incredibly just simple uh, hypnosis and post hypnotic suggestion techniques that are used um, tactically in a way to based on depending on how how deep the hypnosis is and what kind of post hypnotic suggestions there are there. They can completely cordon off the native personality of someone and install something entirely different in there. But it's all done through that that state of dissociation, whether it's through pain and shock or through drugs and pain, uh, basically shutting off um, the analytical awareness of a person, you know, the, the everyday waking conscious mind, reducing its awareness down through shock, or like I said, through drugs or hypnosis. And then once, once that everyday waking mind is shut down, there's still the body's mind that's recording everything. So they can just put that post hypnotic suggestion, install it into someone. And then once they're out of that hypnotic trance, they still have that, um, that post hypnotic suggestion that there's a trigger to, and, you know, they're able to do the whole Manchurian candidate type of thing. And, you know, just depending on like they're saying with the different types of uh, um, electroshock therapy that they're giving to people, just how, how much they could cordon off that person's mind. So when, when their mind goes into certain areas uh, they have that shock that's remembered from the shock treatment and they're just, their mind just dissociates or they, they dissociate from that part. So it's literally like you're taking a, an old, uh, you know, uh, 7,200, RPM hard drive and partitioning off a part of it to put a new operating system into that person. It's, it's essentially the same kind of technology that you can do with a hard drive partition, but yeah, they're still doing it. And it's just, it's, it's a lot simpler nowadays that uh, the trance state is much easier to install into people through, uh, you know, smartphones and the kind of technology that's out there. Now people are incredibly easily entranced. I looked very deeply into the MK ultra thing. Back in the day, do you remember when Britney Spears shaved her head off? And there was all these truther videos saying all these pop stars, they're all MK Untra and monarchs and all this crap. And for a moment, I said, Jesus, when she shaved her head off, I said, myself, and she was obviously going through some kind of breakdown. I said, maybe there's some truth to it. And I looked really, really deep into the whole MK Ultra thing. And there is not a single shred of evidence despite the, 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 the hits that websites like the Vigilant Citizen get, there isn't a shred of evidence that any one pop star has ever been in an MK Ultra program or anything like that. And the videos are not about blowing the whistle, showing them and all this kind of thing. All these kind of, I found less than zero evidence of that. But my God, what an education it was. The, the, the pravity of the MK Ultra thing is almost hard to imagine. The things they did to people were, um, and I remember there was something like 50 universities in the United States were involved in this. Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA at the time, was shocked when all these American servicemen who were POWs in North Korea came back and they were all like espousing Marxist doctrine and saying the United States must be, they'd all been brainwashed. 
and he wanted it, it shocked him and he, he, he had he had, a, he had this thing where he wanted to discover what he called the brainwashing gap where it, what is in the brain where in the brain can you brainwash a person and basically an enormous amount of money was thrown at anyone to produce the most dubious experiments and to say they were evil is like an understatement or mangala level stuff and what happened was and what made them especially evil was many of the people in the program were being told they were getting experimental new experimental treatment for a condition they had. So women that have post, post uh, you know, you know, when a woman goes into depression after there's a baby, uh, I forget the name. Postpartum depression. Yeah. 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 Postnatal depression. And uh, so they tell them, well, we can help you with this new program run out of such and such a university. And the things they did to these women were just, they, they beggar belief. They would put them in a room and they would blast them with loudspeakers saying, you know, after they drugged them with LSD and stuff, they'd say things like, your baby is a bastard. You had an affair on your husband. It's true, isn't it? This kind of thing. And uh, it was horrific what they did. And they did lots of the, the, the things also involved injecting people with drugs. And they have got, like, some of the family members have had bodies exhumed, even in the 1990s. And colossal, colossal amounts of drugs were found in them. Not just like what you think hallucinogenics, but all kinds of drugs, everything. And uh, it was, it is, and, it, and the thing at the end of the day, it achieved nothing. That's why it's still going on. And they, they didn't, they, that it's, it's, it's monument. And that's, I often wonder if that whole thing about like, oh, this new pop star in the video, she's an MK Ultra monarch and she's blowing. Through. I often wonder if that was set up by the CIA itself, that whole mystique to distract right. from the, the evil depravity of what they really did to these innocent people. Yeah. A misassociation of what it is. People associating yeah. MK ultra with Britney Spears and all of that, rather than associating with what it actually is, where now you've got EMDR and uh, some of those other techniques that psychiatrists and psychologists are using, which, you know, I, I don't fucking uh, condone any sort of hypnotherapy out there. I am f terribly fucking against hypnotizing of anyone so all this nlp stuff that the people are getting into and the emdr and they're, they're they've brought back shock therapy too and i i'm terribly fucking against that anybody who, who says that that's a good thing no <laughs> no it's not you're, you're going against the free will and self-determinism of another being by hypnotizing them and giving them something uh to to do outside of their will even if you think you're helping them by stopping them from smoking or whatever the bullshit is that they say no you're doing that against their will and you've caused a um a partition you've caused a dissociation within that person that 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 isn't helping them in any way but no this stuff is coming back now like you said thomas it's it's mengala level it's oh, yeah. uh you know mengala might have been physically doing some of this stuff but you know when you're getting into the psycho spiritual aspects of this um that's that's terrible 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 um to be done to another human being so yeah, I, just, I can't believe that they brought back in particular they brought back the the electroshock therapy to people um, and then through that EMDR no, thing, yeah. And through no fault of their own, Americans are ignorant of this stuff. That's why they, when yeah. they come to Europe and they hear people saying, well, your country's pure evil, look at the things it's done, they're quite shocked. Because they've been told all their lives that America is benevolent and it's never done an evil thing. And it's, you know, it's made mistakes and stuff like that. But they don't know any, you know, the depravity of something like MK Ultra. they're just not aware of. And that thing was also, I think that, you know, these like these sex, these sex abuse things they had here in the in the convents in Ireland and stuff and the Magdalene laundries. I think some MK ultra, ultra went money went to some of the religious orders to torture those women or to inject, give them drugs and stuff like that. Because a lot of the MK ultra stuff was trying to avoid international law or and US law. That's why a woman you may be seeing Buffalo, New York is having postnatal depression. What they did was they moved her over the border to a university in Canada or a hospital. The appalling things to her, and that way she couldn't prosecute them under U.S. law. It took place outside, so we didn't do it. It took place in Canada, and it's just the, the CIA. I mean, I, I mean, how they could actually, how could be, how you, how you could be proud of being a part of an organization that did that without actually they've not, they've not acknowledged it even the Rockefeller Commission and the Church's Commission, which are basically religious groups along with the Rockefeller. Commission were the ones who got this out in public and it all came out and it was, and a lot of it has still been left under wraps because the the Rockefeller Commission was like no it's, it's best like the public don't even know about that so we what we've heard is not even the bottom of the depravity 
And it was all the trust the science motherfuckers who were doing it. Right. Yep. And they're, they're all the types out there doing these weekend EMD or excuse me, weekend NLP classes and everything. And yeah, all that stuff is incredibly and dangerous. Wonder, yeah. And I wonder about things like Burning Man in America. Is right. that some kind of MK Ultra thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you get a, a tremendous amount of the people in the tech industry going out to those events, uh, especially yeah, here in the last few years, but there are, there are so many things like that. Uh, people have mentioned TikTok and some of these other, um, you know, very hypnotic things going on on social media. Some of the video games that are out there um, that a lot of the kids are playing, there's, there's a tremendous amount of, of things tapped into this and, you know, to bring this into another domain a lot of that stuff is controlled by the ccp as well some of those video game developers and things too and i know that a lot of this technology goes back to uh ancient chinese techniques i want to say uh that's where some of the the technology from mk ultra came from is the the, the chinese uh, ability not yeah yeah right yeah. so again but just hypno, hypnotism that's that's not that's black magic we'll just put it like that hypnotism is black magic if you're if you're hypnotizing yourself if you're hypnotizing another person that's pure black magic just period like date, rape, like date rape drugs and things like that right. all fall doesn't matter if you have uh, well i know one prick and uh, they used to live here that became after all those other businesses failed uh, became a hypnotherapist and was try, uh, advertising in the local area and he suddenly vanished and now he, he went back to england and i, I don't even know if he's still alive now but he was a control freak that had to have power over people and it took him it took him a long time to get into the hypnotism thing, but I wasn't surprised when he did. And a lot of cults use hypnotism as well. They'll say, I oh, will discover your alien past or, you know, we'll fix that abduction experience for you and all this stuff. And it's not, it's, 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 it's brainwashing them and, and, and yep. destroying them. I mean, Bud, yep. Bud, Bud Hopkins made all those books back in the eighties on hypnot using hypnotic therapy to, to describe alien uh, abductions as the biggest lot of crap. When he died, he died a broken man. He was, uh, he said, said, said something like, uh, uh, what I did was all wrong. I shouldn't have done it. And those entities that were talking to me or uh, that were, were not, uh, that's another thing too. Entities jump in during hypnotism sessions also. and Because of the dissociation, it leaves the, leaves the oh, fucking yeah. front door wide open. He would say things like, I, well, w w I'm not prompting people. And he put them under a hypnotic state and say, when you walked into the spaceship, what, you know, he was prompting them constantly, you know, and uh, his, he was a big selling author back in the eighties with an artist who turned himself towards this. Now I think his, his thing was genuine, but I think he became addicted with it and God knows how many casualties he left along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. This goes against natural law. When you're talking about causing dissociation with someone, it's like you're, you're hacking someone else's psyche at that point. And also, yeah, it's called, go ahead. People who are highly addictive are very easily hypnotized. That's right, because it's already a hypnotic, yeah. Well, that when, when hypnotic the, state. the stage magician walks into the audience and looks in there on the nightclub, it's the fellow who's is, is smoking. Like, you'd be watching the audience, and the fellow's lighting up one cigarette after the other. And you go, can I have a, a, a from the audience? That gentleman over there in the, in the gray suit. Come on, come on. And the audience goes, yeah, come on, go on. He knows they have no problem hypnotizing him. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's incredible how many, how many industries that's been, uh, that type of technology has been, been uh, put into like with salespeople and stuff. The, well, you know, another light form of hypnotism is copying somebody's mannerisms. When you sit next to them, you, you, you mirror their mannerism to get them into a light state, light, light state of hypnosis. So sometimes when I, when I see somebody doing that, I just, I do something to see if they end up copying my behavior and they, yeah. to see if they put their hand up too. And I'll, you know, I'll do, I'll do gestures to see if they start doing that. Same, like, okay, fucker, you're trying to. It's funny you say, you say Chinese because there's loads of videos on the internet of people doing things and, and people eventually copying them because they can't. And a lot of them tend to be Asian. They're the ones that instantly do it. So it's maybe it's a cultural thing or something that you must conform at any cost. Well, you know what I think Crowley used to do when he'd walk down the streets in New York and go like this? Yeah, copy someone's walking. Yeah. yeah I think that was the that was the kind of like uh, he could project his nervous system out of him. It was the next stage of that, you know, yeah. kind of thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. You, you go and in, go into vibration with someone and, and, and put yeah. yourself into their eyes, so to speak, you know, that other kind of black magic like that, where you can start thinking for someone and, and put post hypnotic suggestions into their mind by thinking for them. Uh, yeah. And the classic example of it's still going on, the Tic Tac Tang dancing nurse yeah. and hospital staff. That was yeah. all. That they, I, I, would, I bet you every one of those hospitals, the hospital administrator got a message from about somebody that says, tell your staff to do dance routines. Yeah, right. I'm, I'm convinced of it. Just, just it like was, the ice bucket challenge, the ALS thing just, that happened. Yeah, the, just, yeah. yeah, just like that. And now it's TikTok dance. The, we were all being MK Ultra fucked in the head with those TikTok dances. Here we've been told there was a pandemic. Sorry, here we were told that there was bit, that there was a, a thing going on. We have to cut that one out. Where the bodies yeah. are the bodies are piled high to the ceiling. The bodies were piled high to the ceiling, and and nobody could actually. And the staff and doctors dying on the job. And what are we seeing? You know, complex right. dance routines. You and and then there's people like you and I, normal people, going, "What the fuck? What the fuck?" And then the rest of the side are going, "Oh, it's not cute." Now that you tell me that wasn't some kind of MK Ultra thing, right? No, that's that and the ice bucket challenge, the ALS thing that people were doing uh, back in like 2013, 2014 of dumping um, buckets of water. And then I, I am going to squash something in the in the comments here. Someone's talking about remote viewing being a dangerous um, a dangerous thing. No, it's not necessarily a dangerous thing. You're not you're not disso- you're not dissociated when you're using remote viewing. And you're it's, not it's, and you're not doing it to someone else. It, right, and you're not doing yeah, and you're not being hypnotized. You're you're using it's. It's well, very it's similar. It's fine. It's only right. when it's on someone else's head. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So remote viewing, no, it's not dangerous. Um, and it's also, it's, it's, it's not being done under a state of dissociation and uh, it's using similar techniques that people would consider, you know, for what, what you call out of body experiences and astral travel and, and things like that, that we've looked into. So no, whoever's saying that Ed Byron, no, it's, 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 it's not the same kind of thing as what we're talking about here. So don't be putting that into people's minds that, that it is. Once you start messing with someone else's head, you're in a very nasty place. Right. So yeah, who you're asking, you know, who it is you, you're asking Rogue Raven about, about, um, about remote viewing. Yeah. Look, look at the farsight or farsight.org stuff. Um, you can look at, uh, Bill Allgaier's, uh, Dick, not Bill, uh, look at Dick Allgaier's stuff. Uh, Courtney and Aziz Brown. Aziz Brown is Courtney's son. Aziz, he's a real smart young guy. I'd love to have him on the symposium sometime. But if you go over to their channel, you can you can learn some of the basic remote viewing techniques if you're interested in that. Also, check out the uh, Robert Monroe stuff, uh, Bob Monroe stuff. He does a lot of of classes. Um, so, again, it's not dissociation. You're not you're not doing it to someone else. You're using your own psych, your own natural psychic abilities that exist within you. We all have these glimpses all the time. You all, every single person gets glimpses of, of psychic impressions from things, you know, you might accidentally, a mother might accidentally or, or inadvertently remote view their child when they know that something has, has gone, you know, wrong in that person's life. It's, it's something that exists out there naturally. And be wary of all the bullshit out there. There's a famous series of photographs of the Roch, a Rothschild party from the seventies and they're wearing these masks that are like split faces with like four eyes, and it looks like this. And there's whole loads of websites of videos saying, oh, it's an MK Ultra thing that they're from the Rothschilds. It wasn't. It was a party given by Salvador, El, uh, uh, Salvador Dali, and the theme was surrealism and masks. So everyone commissioned and built their own mask, a Dali-esque mask, but this party it had nothing to do with like fractured psyches that they were trying. It was none of this stuff. So there's yeah. so much, I think all this crap is put out there by the CIA to distract from the real evil they did. Yeah. It'd, like, it'd be like Joseph Mengele commissioning Hogan's heroes. That's literally, yeah. Yeah. The but, soft yeah, yeah. But it, it's the CIA and, and groups like that that put out that information to, to associate, to misassociate, to misdirect. You know, those, those are misdirect tactics. If we're, if we're going to use, uh, you know, uh, t- terms of war right now, like there's tons of misdirection out there. And, and um, you like know, it's another form earth, of flat earth. And yeah, it. right. Flat earth and all that stuff where it's like, you know, so. Have you off running off in the land of absolute shit? Yeah. You don't actually look at the real stuff. Yep. Yep. So next story. Yeah. All right. Always good to get some clarification. There's a lot of stuff out there. So it's good we talk about these things. <clears throat> okay. Why are large sinkholes opening in the Arctic seabed? 
Something unusual is happening in the depths of the Arctic Ocean. Sinkholes are opening up on the seabed, some as large as a city block. This discovery, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on Monday, was based on high-resolution uh, bathymetric surveys of the Canadian uh, Beaufort Sea. We know that big changes are happening across the Arctic landscape, but this is the first time we've been able to deploy technologies to see that changes are happening offshore as well. Study co-leader at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, geologist Charlie Paul said in a press release, scientists have observed that Arctic permafrost above sea level is thawing because of the climate crisis and opening sinkholes on land that damage infrastructure and harm indigenous communities. For example, instability linked to melting permafrost may have been partially responsible for a massive oil spill in a Russian river in 2020. However, not all Arctic permafrost is above the ground. Some of it was submerged by melting glaciers and sea level rise at the end of the last ice age about 12,000 years ago. Until now, it hasn't been possible to directly observe this permafrost, but a combination of sonar and autonomous mapping robots have allowed scientists to get a sense of what the permafrost beneath the Beaufort Sea looks like. When they first began surveys in 2010, the researchers found a rough patch about 110 miles offshore, which corresponded to the former edge of the Pleiosense permafrost, live science reported. To try to understand the reason for the rough spot, they surveyed the area with, ro with robots in 2013 and 2017 and with sonar in 2019. They discovered that during this time, new craters emerged in the seabed. The largest was 738 feet long by 312 feet wide by 92 feet deep. That's as large as a city block containing a six-story building. Siberian permafrost researcher Evany Chuvlin, who was not involved with the study, said that the pace of change was surprising. Permafrost degradation is a slow process. We're usually talking about centimeters per year. This here is more than merely degradation. It's also a qualitative change. So I would say that, yes, it is unexpected to see. Hypotheses have been voiced in the literature concerning the possibility of such processes, but this is the first time they have been directly observed. Unlike the thawing of above-ground permafrost, the researchers don't think these sinkholes are caused by human-generated climate change. Instead, they think it's part of a longer-term process that had that begun during the last ice age. Heat carried in slowly, moving groundwater systems is contributing to the decay of submerged permafrost, creating large sinkholes in some areas and ice-filled hills called pingos in other areas. However, Paul noted that the Arctic over that the Arctic overall is changing rapidly because of human activity. While the underwater sinkholes we have discovered are the result of longer term glacial interglacial climate cycles, we know the Arctic is warming faster than any other region on earth. As climate change continues to reshape the Arctic, it's critical that we also understand changes in the submerged permafrost offshore. I say we're at the mountains of madness. Climate change. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Climate uh, change. Give me that right. crap. Oh, let's, not, let's not mention that the Arctic, the, 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 the magnetic North Pole is drifting into that area, and that might have something to do with it. Oh, no. Climate change. Climate change. Indigenous cultures. Usual crap. Like we were saying earlier on about these scientists, they're all full of shit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, too, I think we're as as the earth is changing naturally again, these, you know, if we want to use the term even climate change, the climate naturally changes. I think we go through a grand cycle the same way that the planet goes through a cycle in a year of, you know, spring, summer, fall, winter. I would imagine there's something like that that occurs on a macroscopic scale. And we're going through one of those transitions again, where things that were once frozen are going to be unfrozen and things that are now unfrozen will be frozen. And, you know, things that were underwater, blah, 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 going on from there. And I would imagine as some of these places thaw out in the Arctic and the Antarctic, we're going to find, you know, leftover stuff from like we talk about all the time, you know, past civilizations. And that's, that's just something that I think is a terribly mundane thing that we need to, you know, get into our, our, our current scientific paradigm that, oh yeah, there's, there's layers of stuff that our, our previous uh, iterations of human civilization have made just like someday, you know, there'll be, you know, a Walmart that gets, you know, uh, buried underground and frozen over and someday it's going to thaw out and there's going to be, you know, uh, the McDonald's and Walmart is going to show itself and they're going to be like, oh yeah, here's, here's this temple from, from circa, you know, 2022 <laughs> that, that, you know, they, they worship the golden arches and, and the thing called a Big Mac. And, and, you know, that'll, that'll be what people are looking at. And in a couple thousand, you know, maybe 12,000 years from now, a, uh, 
you know, a Big Mac encased in, you know, in, in stone or something. And, yep. you know, we're, we're going to find, you know, things like this. And I want to say that, you know, some of the, some of the cities that we've built uh, our structures on top of were, you know, things that had existed eons ago. And, you know, like the, if they're talking about something being the Grand Canyon, another explanation could be that, yeah, that was just a, that was something left over from a long time ago and it just was buried underground. And I would like to think that, you know, around the planet, we can just find layers and layers and layers of, of past civilization like that. And I think, I think it's fascinating if, if we were able to catalog them and see, okay, this was from the previous iteration. This might've been from two iterations ago, you know, the pyramids, you know, might be from four or five iterations ago and the Sphinx from some other time, you know, I, I would imagine that, you know, we, we could trace these down and catalog them. It's just that, again, this goes against the current scientific and academic paradigm to say that, oh no, you know, mankind came out of mud, you know, roughly five, 6,000 years ago. And then the, the, the biblical time frame was shit. You know, they're, they're trying to always explain it that way that no, there's been this constant progress that we're at the peak of, or going this way, the peak of, um, of civilization right now. And that there's never been anything higher that, you know, people from back down the evolutionary scale wore loincloths and, you know, the people that, that did all this were a bunch of savages. It's like, no, people from way back then might have been more advanced than we are now. You know, their technology looked different. You know, our technology currently looks different than any other one did. But again, I think there's a tremendous amount of um, bullshit put out there by a lot of the people out on YouTube and bit shoot and all that that will take something and put it into the flat earth category, for instance, or any of the other ones like that, where, you know, there'll be a little bit of this truth that's uncovered. And then it'll all go into, you know, that there's no, there's no mountains. There's just tall trees and stuff like that. And I, I rem you remember the ozone there, the ozone hole. We were told that was the end of the fucking world, that, that children in New Zealand could never put bad bear skin in, in public outside ever again, because they would get melanomas and uh, skin cancer. That in South Africa, the people would all have to leave because the, there was no protection from the sun the same in Patagonia. They were going to be populated. And it went on for a good decade. End of the world. Oh, we're all fucked. The ozone layer. It's all caused by aerosol cans. And he had everyone screwed, screwed in the head, terrified about the ozone layer and how you couldn't use aerosol cans anymore. And guess what happened? They turned around and it suddenly closed up and they go, oh, we got that wrong. Didn't you say that? They go, oh, so it's cyclical, it's cyclical after all. After Everybody wanted to blame the hairdressers for the fucking end of the ozone layer. <laughs> fucking well, cancer hairspray and shit. Uh, well, well, let me what tell, are we going to do? Uh, no, let me tell you, love, I was part of the underground music scene in the 80s and it was a plausible theory. <laughs> Aquanet, man. Aquanet oh, fucking oh, killed the was, human that, species. That, that, that was, you know, uh, there's something about using that Aquanet stronghold with a crimping iron to get that thing, that gothy kind of look. I think that probably destroyed it. <laughs> There was, it was a plausible theory at the time because literally yeah. my memory of the of the, of the 1980s is Paul Mitchell and uh, Aquanet Hairspray. And Hell every, yeah. Everywhere. Hell yeah. <laughs> Some good shit. And it's like that same bullshit they're doing now with no straws over here. I don't know if you guys have that bullshit going on where you live, yeah. but there's that one video where a turtle had a barnacle in its nose. A poor turtle there. Some people were pulling the barnacle out of his nose or its nose and... Uh, that got misinterpreted as it being a plastic straw. And ever since that viral video, it's like, now we have all these, yeah, we have all these weird ass uh, metal straws that, you know, are very dangerous. And then like straws that start like uh, breaking down and who knows what kind of fucking chemicals are in those that people are digesting. And it's like, you can't get a fucking straw anywhere now. <laughs> and it's like all because of that one video of a turtle with a barnacle in its nose. You know, that, that, that joke I often make about, you know, the, the guys, the men are carrying on like a bunch of 1970s hairdressers and the dryers are broken. Is, is, is it just me? Or is that how all scientists now behave? Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, remember, uh, two years ago, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia was supposed to be dead. And then I said, yeah, no, wow. no, it's not dead. We didn't really mean it that way. It's just it's the, the hysteria they come out with. Yeah. So this hysteria that they hit the public with, whether it's a... Um a thing that we've all been experiencing for the last few years or something or a new war, there's always these, uh, these emotions that get um, instilled kind of MK ultra style, you know, hypnosis, you know, post-hypnotic you know, suggestion. The way it's yeah. like the Simpsons uses, like, you know, when chaos magic comes out in comedy and the, the Simpsons has been shown to be like doing that over the years. There's a hilarious 1970s sketch uh, from Monty Python 
of a group of hairdressers trying to assault the north face of, of, of Everest. And they're all like big queens, you know, like, and they're going, oh, we got it. And it's like those base camp Mario's, you know, and we go, and we got the 10,000 feet and we have to use all our extra supply to keep the hair dryers going. And it's just exactly <laughs> what science became, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, it's just one of those things that the hype that's that, that, that uh, is getting put out there. People are, you know, brainwashed the, the mass, the, the masses of people are, are brainwashed by it. And then they start getting these emotions and then maybe there's something out there feeding on the emotions it's it's like it's a harvest, you know. the The seed of of paranoia is put out there. It starts to grow, and then when it's time to harvest that energy, the energy is harvested, and then enough for the next cycle of bullshit to occur, you know, enough to get people to forget about the last cycle of it. It's like you know, out out with the last one, in with the next one, feeding, yeah. you know, just just. That's why that, that, that term know. "trust the science" to me has become equating. I can equate that now with like listen to the demon, you know, like yeah. that kind of thing. It's like. Science is complete. Is not completely demonic, but that kind of science, that political science, it, it, it's demons feeding. I'm, I'm no doubt about it. Yeah, when people use science with a capital S, as if science is a is a uh, what's that, a proper noun kind of thing, where where science says this, science says that. It's like no, the scientific method is one thing by itself, and science is a process. But there's no noun science, so to speak. Like yeah, science is is something like music, art. Yeah, but with a with a capital S like that, they might as well, you know, a hundred years ago they would have just been saying God, right? <laughs> you know, the will of God kind of thing. So it's like people people look at science as if it's this infallible thing. We're like we, like we said earlier with with uh, we're we're allegedly at the point in time where we're at the highest point of of human uh, evolution and everything. We know fucking everything allegedly. So it's like science knows everything. Uh, and also, but no, I'm already yeah. at history. You know, like history stops. Yeah, the history's gone. Right. Bullshit. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So. No. all right well i think that's a wrap on episode 36 unless you all have any last things you want to say about that fuck hypnotism i'm doing an event in in collinstown near old castle in county westmead on april 21st entitled it's a spiritual war all of it and yes. I, I think it's free in and it's a hundred, it's a hundred, the hall holds over a hundred people. So come on and see me in Collinstown in, on the 21st of April. Is that something that's going to be recorded that we can see later? I'm going to ask them to do it for this channel to keep it on here, but we'll see. Uh, they, I haven't, I'm, I'm going to ask them to do that, but I'm going to bring my cameras down just in case anyway, or at Excellent. least the audio. Yeah. We'll All right, you guys. Um, in the flesh. We'll have a beer. Yeah. Go out and see Thomas if you're in that neck of the woods. All right, you guys. Well, thank you once again to everybody that tuned in, commented, um, shared, liked, all that type of stuff. We really appreciate it all. We had another really great time today hanging out and shooting the shit and talking about weird stuff <laughs> like we always do. <laughs> so, Thomas, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your evening. And uh, we will see you guys next week. Keep it strange, motherfuckers. That's right. Don't let keeping it real go wrong. <laughs>